this week on the Roommates Podcast. Uh, one of the uh, first things we establish in the book is that you get three wishes for your ideal partner, right? And while this may sound like common sense, what we find is that, so like in class, I'd do this exercise. I'd say, everybody write down everything you want in your ideal romantic partner. And they would sit there for, you know, five minutes and they would write like 20, 25 things, <laughs> right? Great. Why not? Right. And then I'd bring up someone random, someone would volunteer their anonymized form. And we would then go down how many people they would eliminate based on those wishes. So let's say it was a heterosexual female student and she wanted a tall guy. Now, if there were a hundred single guys in the room, just by probability, 80 of those guys would have to sit down or walk out. Exactly. Right? Because only 20% of men in the U.S. are six foot or taller. But we make these criteria without thinking about how that narrows our field dramatically. And what we would always find is that in a room of 150 or 200 people, after three wishes, it was down to one person, if not a fraction of a person. <laughs> Yo, what's good, everybody? This is Afiz from the Roommates Podcast, and I am in the lovely New York City. Another fun fact about me, I was actually born in New York City, Staten Island, Staten Island, New York, that is. And this week's episode is a, a treat. <laughs> this is a person that I recently stumbled upon, and I read one of their books. And the book was groundbreaking. It had so much confirmation bias of ideas that I was currently thinking about and wrestling with. And I said, I have to get this guy on the show. I immediately sent him an email. He was so kind and gracious and so eager to come on the show. So, man, you guys are going to love this guy. Please, guys, welcome to the show. The one, the only, Ty Tashiro. Hey, thanks for having me. Oh, uh, man, thank you so much for opening your home for us to be able to record. <laughs> sure, it's a tiny home yeah, here in New York, yeah, but uh, yeah, glad yeah. you could come over. No problem, no problem. So, Ty, I know who you are. For the audience who doesn't know who you are, can you go ahead and share who you are and what you do and all that good yeah, stuff? Yeah, sure. So, uh, my background's in psychology, actually. Um, I did my graduate work at the University of Minnesota. Go Gophers. Go Gophers. You go guys go are 8-0 right now? 8-0. No, just beat Penn State. So we're <laughs> riding that wave. Yes, sir. Uh, I, I loved it. You know, I loved It's a very empirical, research-oriented approach at Minnesota. Okay. And um, I didn't think I'd like research, actually, but I... I had a little bit of a knack for it, and more importantly, I think I had a real passion That's awesome. for it. And um, the study of romantic relationships is pretty recent, actually. It was just in the late 1950s, early 1960s, when people started looking into this. And I was lucky because one of the professors there, Ellen Brashide, was one of the first two people to ever apply the scientific method to romantic relationships. Oh, wow. Yeah. And it was just this radical idea that she was actually hauled before the Senate to defend oh, really? her work. Um, and some people thought it was almost like the sacrilegious thing mm. to apply something methodical and scientific to something they saw as spiritual or uh, unable to be known mm. and maybe didn't want to be known. Yeah, uh, But now we know quite a bit about romantic relationships and uh, some of the reasons why we struggle in them, uh, some of the good things we can do to make them work better. And so... I guess I was teaching a class at the University of Maryland uh, for undergraduates. They're great, about 150, 200 of them. And we'd go through all the data and the studies, and they would have these questions about, they're like, yeah, that's nice, but I got this question about this girl. <laughs> you know? yeah, yeah, or yeah. I just got dumped and, you know, they kind of thinly veil it. You know? mm -hmm. So I got this friend who. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And, you know, sometimes I'd ride the Metro home and I'd just be kicking myself. Because I think, oh, there, there was a better answer to that. There was actually research that was really relevant to that student's question, and I didn't come up with it in the moment. Now, it was nice because I was able to go back the next time and say, hey, uh, this is actually how this thing ties in. But I thought there's this wealth of information um, that could help people understand some of the things that seem unknowable in romantic relationships and could also just help them use their own inner wisdom to guide themselves down a better path. And that's why I decided to write the book, The Science of Happily Ever After, uh, which was my first book. And then uh, I just kind of stayed on that author path, uh, speaking path and all of that. And I've, I've enjoyed being able to share things like 
the science of romantic relationships. And the second book I did was on the science of social awkwardness. <laughs> so if we have some awkward romantic scenarios, we can talk about those too. Um, but yeah, that's kind of what I'm doing these days and how I got into it. All right. That's, that's great. I think that's so important to be able to focus on the romantic relationship, especially for young adults who struggle with it so much. So for the people who don't know about your book, The Science of Happily After, Ever After, can you tell the people why you decided to write that book and what that book is basically about? Yeah, sure. Um, well, well, part of it was I thought someone must have written this book already, right? And I kind of look, there's a lot of great books out there, but some of the books tend to be about, um, hey, I had this relationship. It lasted for 40 years. You should do it my way. Mm. You know, and that's a value. Anecdotal experiences. For sure. Um, but if your uh, life experience doesn't fit that person's, uh, or if your goals don't fit that person's, then that's a little bit of a mismatch. Uh, there were some things about almost how to be manipulative, like how to lock Pick somebody down. Community, stuff like that. Yes, exactly. Like Neil Strauss, the game, books along right, those lines. Right. There's both uh, male and female yep. <laughs> versions of these kinds the of books. The female version of it, the most popular one that I've read was um, something about, oh, I forgot, it's a really popular book. But all I know is that, that somewhere bitches are in the title. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I know what you're talking about. You know about. what I'm I, talking I, about? I, yeah, yeah I, like I a can't. really best-selling book. Like, why men love bitches. Yeah, yeah. That's That's, that's right. And, yeah. and there is some good advice yeah. in there. But um, but just not kind of the approach I was going to take in, in this book. And so I couldn't believe there was this gap. And I thought, well, let's let's give this a shot. And my goal was to not try to be preachy about things. Uh, we don't like to be told what to do for anything in our lives. I'm actually the opposite. I was reading your book. I was like, give me the rules. <laughs> give me the yeah. rules, Ty. No, you you got to figure it out, you know? <laughs> um, and that's kind of what I wanted, you know? I want people to be like, okay, so here's this framework, and I feel this urge to try to solve this puzzle, but then they got to solve it for themselves. Um, because romantic relationships, they're just so idiosyncratic. Uh, as my old advisor uh, liked to used to say, uh, the problem with romantic love is it takes two people to make it work and only one person to make it not work, mm. right? <laughs> and I found that a lot of times when things aren't working well in a relationship, that's actually a pretty good answer a lot of times. But that also gets to this idea that there's so much complexity. You have two complex human beings from different backgrounds with oftentimes different goals and attitudes trying to join together into this seamless relationship. That's that's some high level stuff, and so it it's is. no wonder people struggle with it. That's a really good point. We had um, one of our friends, her name is Taylor Rooks. He's a really popular sports reporter for Bleacher Report. Shout out Taylor! <laughs> and uh, Taylor Rooks, she was just talking about how she said to get somebody to feel a certain way about you, and then you to also feel that way back to that person is so rare. Oh yeah, you know. And she was just saying that. Why do we not cultivate that more? Why do we not value that more? Why do we not look into that more? And your point about in the book is that for so many years, this field was kind of looked down upon. Like it was the, like, oh, this is not real science. You know, let's make some rockets or go yeah. to the moon or let's go to Mars. You know, that's sure. a real science. But what you were saying is that for almost every human being across all cultures and ethnic backgrounds and religions and sexual orientations were interested in creating and cultivating healthier relationships. While some may be doing it in a more unorthodox way, there's a general curiosity for that among, I mean, across all groups. Yeah, it's, it's a, a fundamental drive is the jargony term, right? We'd use in psychology. Um, but yeah, uh, uh, I mean, I, I can't, say I've ever met anybody who, who hasn't felt that uh, across the diversity of uh, kinds of interests that, that could be out there. And so even if someone were to not be interested, they'd probably be interested in why they're not interested. Exactly. Right? Exactly. Um, like there's certain things in life where nobody really gives you the handbook. And you, you think, I think everybody else got this handbook and, and I didn't get it. Um, but, but none of us got it. And so I think anything we can do as social scientists to say, hey, your taxpayer dollars have, have been spent uh, to fund research that helps us describe what seems indescribable, uh, helps us organize things that seem really chaotic, and, and might even help you uh, predict 
some good things in life that you want or, or avoid things that, that would be bad for you. I, I think there's this imperative for us to share that science in a way that's, that's user-friendly, um, that uses stories and personal narratives to try to engage people. Uh, and I think that's what I, I really enjoyed about, I, I guess, both of the books was this challenge of how do you take this enormous body of research and, and some of it a little bit esoteric and out yeah, there, yeah, you know? Yeah, yeah. And that's what my students at Maryland did for me is they helped me realize like, hey, there's a totally different language with which we need to communicate this information. And uh, I, I love doing that. And I love seeing, seeing people light up. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, one of the uh, first things we establish in the book is that you get three wishes for your ideal partner, right? And while this may sound like common sense, what we find is that, so like in class, I'd do this exercise. I'd say, everybody write down everything you want in your ideal romantic partner. And they would sit there for, you know, five minutes and they would write like 20, 25 things, <laughs> right? Great. Why not? Right. And then I'd bring up someone random, someone would volunteer their anonymized form. And we would then go down how many people they would eliminate based on those wishes. So let's say it was a heterosexual female student and she wanted a tall guy. Now, if there were a hundred single guys in the room, just by probability, 80 of those guys would have to sit down or walk out. Exactly. Right? Because only 20% of men in the U.S. are six foot or taller. But we make these criteria without thinking about how that narrows our field dramatically. And what we would always find is that in a room of 150 or 200 people, after three wishes, it was down to one person, if not a fraction of a person. Oh, wow. Right? Yeah. Uh, because let's say then you want uh, somebody who matches on political values. We have about a 33% chance of that happening. So of the 20 people remaining, right, you cut that down dramatically. And you can imagine whatever wish you made <laughs> right next um, gets you down to one or, or not even a full person. So just that basic idea of let's try to uh, think about what you want in a partner. But now let's prioritize it. Let's make sure at the very least the top three things you want in a partner are front and center in your mind and that you're being disciplined about actually looking for those things and not things that are kind of uh, superfluous or that don't matter. Yeah, no, we're definitely, let's, let's stay here because I, I want to get to the superfluous things as well. Yeah. Those are my favorite. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, for, but, for, for all of us, those are our favorite. But, yeah. uh, but one of the points that I love, I just, like I said, it was so much confirmation bias because, you know, great minds think alike. And a lot of times me and my friend Francis would always talk about these ideas and converse about them. And then to be able to see not just you share these ideas, but what I love so much about your book, The Science of Happily Ever After, make sure you guys buy it if you haven't bought it already is that you probably, to me, are like the leading expert when it comes to the objective data. And so one of the points that we were bringing up is that for a lot of people, their beliefs are based upon anecdotal experiences or media exposure. Mm -hmm. And we talked about the importance of being able to get objective data to be able to back up your beliefs because you can, if, you, if you're not, you end up believing a lie that can negatively affect your life. So one of the points I love so much about the book was when you talked about those three wishes, because for most people, they're taught, oh, create a long laundry list of individuals and then, you know, just either pray about it or, you know, <laughs> ask the universe and, you know, what, if it's meant to be, it's meant to be, yeah, right? Yeah, it's going to yeah, happen yeah, for sure. you. Yeah, yeah. And for most people, as you argue in the book, you know, they don't have that. Yeah. You know, they never find that person. And one of the points was how they don't understand how some of your standards affect your probability, which the first thing that you brought up was about height. Yeah. And where some people said, I want a guy who's six foot two or taller. Mm -hmm. And not knowing that, I believe it's either 6.5 or I think 6.5 or 3.5 percent of the population is six two or six, six two or taller. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. off rip alone, you're going to lose 90 percent of <laughs> yeah. your body of work. <laughs> right. You know, right. And I love the example you gave with the Catholic school girl when she was looking for the guy. And why do you feel like so many people don't understand that the more you ask, the less likely it is that you're going to find somebody? Why do people mm. feel like, OK, I can ask for whatever I want and I can always get that kind of person? Sure. Well, you know, one of the things I'm wondering is if we're a little more prone to it now, just because, you know, back back when it, it was pretty rural, 
right? And so, like, uh, my mom grew up in a small town outside Ithaca, New York here. I think she went to, she said she had four or five guys she could have gone to the homecoming dance with, <laughs> right? <laughs> That's a pretty different kind of scenario. And so now you have to be pretty thoughtful, right? Uh, we're very uh, urban now. We're surrounded by, we're going to walk down the street, we're going to be surrounded by thousands of people. Uh, you can just go on your phone. Obviously, there's millions of people available there. And I think people think there's just this surplus. And so I can be, I can get whatever I want. Almost like an all-you-can-eat buffet, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but just like an all-you-can-eat buffet, even though there's all that food there, more than you could ever eat, if you were indiscriminate about how you went through it, the the what you prioritized, you know, first and last and so forth, you might fill up on bread, <laughs> you know, and now you don't have room for dessert or some of these other things <laughs> yeah, yeah, that you yeah. the prime rib that's, that you that <laughs> yeah. you really wanted. Yeah, this is good. And so, uh, you know, just just like someone would want to strategize in that situation it, for anything in life, you want to have this strategy about, hey, what's the order of operations that I want to have in my head as I go into this really important task? Now, choosing a romantic partner. Is a lot more important than <laughs> choosing good food at a buffet, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but it, it's it's amazing at, uh, how few people, including myself, until I kind of caught wind of this stuff, had ever thought about, well, how would I rank order this list in the top three or even a top ten? Now, the the good news is, is I was being hard on people when I said you get three wishes. You probably can get more than that, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, but you definitely want those top three clear. What I tell people is, yeah, we'll get, get get a top ten laid out. Uh, make sure you get the top three things that you want. Uh, and what people realize is they're like, boy, I've had these criteria that just I don't even care <laughs> about. But maybe I had. Maybe the culture told me I should care about these things. Mm, that's good. Right? Or maybe I had some teenage remnants of yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. from my pop magazine or something, <laughs> you know, that I yeah, wanted. Yeah, yeah. And they're like, gosh, that's that's really not important. You know, I had someone tell me, <laughs> she said I was always trying to date tall guys, and I realized I was dating a bunch of tall jerks. <laughs> you know? And maybe I should flip that on its head, you mm -hmm. know, and that maybe the most important thing is I need to look for somebody who's nice somebody who's considerate. And while that sounds like common sense in hindsight, how many of us or we have friends who are in situations that are not good, mm -hmm. they have not prioritized well, and uh, and part of it's just that they, they didn't think it through before they got into it. No, that's really good. And one of the things I want to jump to next is some of the histories of pair, the history of pair bonding and the history of marriage in which you talk about in the book. And one of the things that you talked about was we went from, you know, purpose driven relationships to now romantic driven relationships. And can you explain to the people some of the differences between those two of the purpose driven relationships of the past compared to what we idolize and fantasize about the romantic relationships of the present? Yeah, it, it's. It's interesting. Uh, historians have this really kind of cold <laughs> perspective on romantic love. Um, but th th you can almost see them squinting and being like, you know, why are people marrying for love? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah, yeah. Um, and that might sound strange to, to us in modern day. But, you know, for the um, marriage is about 5000 years old for 99 percent of that time, people married for pragmatic reasons. Uh, it was sometimes economic you know, oftentimes for childbearing uh, and protecting those children to uh, be raised to a reproductive age of their own. Uh, you know, it's easy to forget that for most of human history, we we're in small hunter-gatherer groups. Uh, a lot of people died during childbirth or, or died as, as infants. And it was a real battle just to struggle to, one, stay alive yourself, two, to have enough kids that would reach a reproductive age and, and not die of some malady. But around the late 1800s, uh, mid 1800s to late 1800s, there were a lot of great innovations, uh, thanks to science, <laughs> that happened. Things like better sanitation, uh, just washing your hands, for example, um, taking care of water and, and purifying that. And so people start to live a lot longer. And now all of a sudden, there wasn't as much risk and people started to have more wealth and you don't have to worry about your kid getting attacked by a wildebeest or <laughs> whatever. Uh, things got a lot more safe. And that's about the same time 
that the Romantic era sprouted up. And people might think about Romantic era music or Romantic era painting, and it's around that same time. And the value at that time was strongly felt emotion and, and passion. And what happened is Romantic love became this moral imperative. So whereas before it was just nice, <laughs> if you're like, okay, uh, you know, my, my parents sold these cows and now we're, I'm partnered with this person for the rest of my life. I hope I like them. Uh, now it became, it's a moral imperative for me to be in passionate love with this person that I'm going to marry and for that to endure. And, and that's a pretty tall, that's a pretty tall task. No, that's really good. I remember there was a study that was done in 1960s, and I believe you quoted in the book. If not, I've read it in another article where it said that in 1960s, they asked a group of women um, if they if there was a man who had all the qualities in the husband, but they didn't feel any romantic love for them, would they marry them? And 95% of women said yes. Now you ask a group of women today that same question. You have a uh, man who has all the qualities in the husband, but you had no romantic love for him. Would you marry them? And now 99 would say no. Yeah. <laughs> and so like you right. said, we see that this romantic love feeling is such a huge, it's, just, it's the biggest component it is. for everybody. It's the thing. Yeah. Yes. And this is where people may not like <laughs> some of the <laughs> conclusions, but for every single sociologist expert in this field has always told me that romantic feeling goes away mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but most people don't believe that mm. and most people still chase that yeah why well uh you know sometimes people say you know i, I should clarify i guess that when we say that romantic love goes away we're talking about that passionate love so that butterfly in the stomach heart pounding cell phone text checking <laughs> kind of romantic love right yeah 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 um th that phase and and i think rationally everybody knows that right it doesn't mean that you lose love for the person it's just going to change um but to the question of why is that passionate love uh fade or diminish a bit you know, people say, why does it have to go away? I say, well, because you would die, <laughs> you know, <laughs> like a uh, pounding heart's another word for high blood pressure. And those butterflies in your stomach leave this hormonal trail that would eventually burn an ulcer <laughs> in your stomach, right? <laughs> this is really high activated physiological state, which is awesome and wonderful. I think people should experience it for as long as they can. Um, but it's just unrealistic that you could <laughs> sustain that. And we also just have things to take care of in life, <laughs> right? Yeah. Um, besides seeing if so-and-so texted us. But, um, yeah, you know, it's just it, it, the purpose of that evolutionarily, the, the thought is, is what better way to get two people to get together and mate, right? Mm. And let's say that lasts for two or three years. Well, now you've gotten a kid to a somewhat functional stage yeah. by that point. That's a pretty cold way to look at it. Um, but, you know, that's where you get to the transition. So there are couples that make it to 50, 60 years of marriage, and they've been happy for the large majority of those years. And a lot of times I think uh, younger people almost have this, you know, kind of fascination or envy about that, where they're like, these these two old timers just seem to like hanging out. <laughs> you know what I mean? And it doesn't have to be that they're doing something extravagant or crazy. Um, there's clearly a love there for one another, but it's it's this deep kind of loyal love, and there's just this ineffable connection between them that's that's really beautiful. So, you know, passionate love will go away. That's a bummer yeah. because it's, it's great while it lasts. But uh, if the relationship if you've chosen well and, and you work hard at it, it can certainly change into something different. Is, and what I love that you brought up in the book is not only is it different, but it's more satisfying and, it, and it's just as pleasurable as the first one, yeah. if not more. And the point that I see is for a lot of people, because passionate love is such an important criteria, um, the moment that it goes away, because they're under the impression that's supposed to be there forever, that's when they end the relationship. Yeah. And that's when they divorce. Yeah. And what you've noticed is that I would argue that before a no-fault divorce, when you hit that, you know, wall of that passion love going away because it wasn't as easy to leave, you were then forced to take this journey to 
the second phase yeah, yeah. if you've chosen well correctly. Sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah. To yeah. true love. And nowadays, most people don't want to work. Yeah. They just want to find somebody who's a perfect match and then live happily ever after. Yeah. And like you brought up, like that's Hollywood. <laughs> you know, that's <laughs> right. that those are new ideas, but for couples who are happily satisfied, that's not their story. Exactly. You know, and uh, I'm glad you bring up the fairy tales. <laughs> I mean, it, it was really interesting. I thought, well, one of the first stories were read as kids, and the first stories were read are fairy tales. And we all know how those go. Uh, and they're great. You know, I love a good fairy tale myself. <laughs> um, but it always ends with uh, two people are brought magically together, and um, fate intervenes, and they live happily ever after. And that's the end of the story. And I guess as if the time has gone along, I'm like, well, that's not the end of the story, right? <laughs> yeah. There's like 40 or 50 years after that. Mm -hmm. um, and that's where it gets real. Uh, and that's where the rubber really hits the road. So, um, yeah, but yeah, I, th I think even if you look at divorce data, the um, predominant reason why people get a divorce is because they've felt this absence of passionate love, which... You know, that was going to change anyways. It's not because there's this um, high prevalence of negativity. Now, sometimes that's the case, but it's not the most common case why people divorce. And, and one of the things that I think is really important about that is that kids don't fare as well when the reason for the divorce is that just the magic seemed to have faded. Mm. You know, now if the there's been high conflict and you're yelling and screaming at each other, there's a divorce the kids actually fare better when that happens then. So it's not just for the couple, but, you know, oftentimes it's the case that child rearing takes place still um, in the context of some sort of romantic relationship. Mm -hmm. And um, that does have some impact on kids. No, that's really that's a really good point. And one of the things I want to kind of talk about that you uh, address in the book as well was how when we're choosing... When we're picking traits for a partner, like going back to everybody's list, how a lot of things that we desire on that list really has nothing to do with that person being able to sustain a healthy relationship. That's right. And, and to me, I had this illustration in my mind going back to track and field. So in track and field, all the a athletes on the track are runners. They yeah. run. But the difference is each of them run a different kind of race. Mm. So what you'll notice is the bigger, bulkier guys are usually the short distance guys. Mm -hmm. So if you're looking at a running and you see a big, bulky guy or a more fast twitch muscle guy, you'll say, oh, I want him for the race. That's the guy I want. And then you'll have the more smaller, slimmer guys who are the more marathon runners. Sure. You know, they may not be as flashy phys physically as the guys who built fast twitch muscle, but their muscles are able to endure a, a stress for a longer period of time. And what happens is in today's society, everybody wants this marathon marriage, mm -hmm. 20, 30, 40, 50 year marriage. But what they pick are sprinters. <laughs> that's a great analogy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's a great you know, analogy. Yeah. Like people pick these sprinters and then when the sprinter can't go the distance because all the values that they put an emphasis on doesn't, doesn't contribute to. A uh, twenty-seven mile race. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. And hey, watching this muscle-bound guy and, yeah. <laughs> and laugh twenty to really struggle. Yeah, yeah. And no, that's that. I, I love that an analogy. Um, especially, it's got the added layer of the the sprinting races are usually the sexier, yeah, uh, you yeah, know, more yeah, fun yeah. races to to watch. Yeah. But yeah, no, that's that's exactly right. You know, if you kind of take a step back from it and you think about, okay, if I had to make a relationship with anybody, let's say a roommate or a friend or whatever, work for 40 or 50 years, what type of person would that be? And see, I think that's where uh, all of our inner wisdom can come into play. Because I think people, like your listeners, for example, they're sitting there thinking, yeah, <laughs> I got some ideas about what that person would look like. Now, if they compare that wisdom they have about that type of person to the kind of person they're kind of going for when they're choosing a romantic relationship, and maybe it lines up, but but maybe not. Yeah, most right? of the times it doesn't. Yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah exactly. Yeah. So, you know, one of the ways you can think about this is return on investment. So if you can only choose a certain number of qualities in a romantic partner or have to prioritize those, 
then you want to get the traits that would have the biggest long-term payoff, right? Just like a stock or a bond or whatever else. Now, the things that we tend to prioritize have a really poor <laughs> return on investment. So one of the things they find is this, is if they do a study and they just ask, what do you want in a romantic partner? So kind of like I did with my students. Um, the things that are at the top are usually things like, I want someone with good values, or I want someone who's kind, or, you know. Um, all the PC stuff. All the PC <laughs> stuff, essentially, right? Yeah, Because yeah, that's yeah. what you're supposed to say. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> right? yeah. yeah. Um, but when you watch what people actually do, so they have studies like speed dating studies, or, or now with online dating, they have, they have rich data there, too. Uh, if you watch what people prioritize, heterosexual men tend to prioritize physical attractiveness first, mm -hmm. socioeconomic status second. Mm -hmm. uh, heterosexual women, uh, you get the flip-flop. Socioeconomic status first, physical attractiveness second. Mm. Um, and what's happened then, if those are the top two of the three wishes, you start to think about, so what got pushed out, mm, <laughs> right? Other good. than the number one spot or the number two spot. Now, before we go to that, it's there's a lot of data about, so let's say you did pick somebody who was wealthy. Does that pay off in relationship happiness? Or satisfaction and does that pay off in a long durable relationship that's going to last and the answer is no so uh, if you get a bit above the poverty line about eight thousand ten thousand dollars past the poverty line that's protective uh, that's good just because being below that uh, amount of income is stressful right but once you pass that it's a real point of diminishing return so I kind of like to tell people the difference between partner who makes $70,000 and one who makes $700,000 is, is pretty negligible. You know, you're not getting much past past that point. And that's really fascinating because for a lot of women, like you point out, they prioritize that so much. Mm -hmm. like they say he has to make this amount of money. And what you're saying is that it actually has no correlation to your personal happiness. No. Yeah. It, you know, it, it, it just kind of balances out because let's, let's say the person makes a lot of money. That comes with its own problems, mm -hmm. right? How much time they will be able to spend with you? How much time they'll be able to spend it with the children? You know, yeah. are they going to put their career first? All types of things that could be a factor. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. You know, so, um, you know, De Deion Cole's got a great, <laughs> great thing about keys, you know, and he's like, you want a guy who's got more than one key? Because that means you only got one key for one thing, right? Um, but you don't want a guy with too many keys, <laughs> you know? Because then he's going to be opening doors for other people, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And uh, I think there's some there's some truth to that. So, well, there's nothing wrong with making a lot of money. Um, you shouldn't be pushing people out or, or ruling them out because they're not dripping with wealth, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but the same thing goes for looks. So, looks has no impact on your long-term satisfaction or your long-term That's the hardest ability. thing for my listeners. I see all my guys right now just dying yeah. on the computer. I feel like for so many guys, even me reading that chapter of the book, it was like, it was so hard. Yeah. Yeah. It's hard for me. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Yeah. I mean, you, you know, I like to say you don't want to feel like kissing your partner is like eating your veggies. Yeah. yeah right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, you want a certain level of attraction there. Um, but to put a little more nuance uh, on it, I guess, what happens is we try to maximize looks. Mm. So we're like, we're trying to get the hottest person possible yeah. for, you know, based on where we are. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <for> looks, <laughs> or what we, um, based on our market value, as I would say, <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. And it's like, well, th that extra point or two you're getting in looks, it's, it's just not going to make that big of a difference. Yeah. And, and as, as, incongruent as that is for me to wrap yeah. my head around still it's like no but hey if you were attracted to somebody versus like okay i'm, I'm really physically attracted to this person mm -hmm. it's, it's not gonna make a huge difference yeah. probably when you add in everything else exactly right and one of the things that's fascinating to me about this is that even in sexual satisfaction studies i mean looks matter up to a certain point but you don't get gravy for the yeah, person yeah, being yeah, hotter, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, there's even some evidence to suggest if the person's too hot, like, well, maybe they didn't have to give as much effort yeah, to, yeah, to yeah, things, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's a great point. Yeah, the the looks thing. I mean, I, one of the things I've heard from a lot of readers that's been gratifying, <laughs> as I've heard from folks, is that they uh, people will write me and they say, you know, there is this guy or this woman, 
and I thought they were kind of cute. <laughs> and then I got to know them, and that's when they really got attractive. To yeah, me, you know, and that that kind of makes me feel good to to hear that because that's a pretty solid foundation to build on. Now that's so good because similar to what you just said, what I noticed was. Like we said previously, the looks threshold was so high. People wanted people in the 85th, 90th percentile, sure. you know, cutting out 15, 10 percent. I mean, uh, remaining only with 15 to 10 percent of the population. And in regards to a longevity, which you're talking about the marathon, what, which is what everybody wants, you know, right. like that has no correlation between satisfaction. Yeah. So you end up pushing out so many people. Mm hmm. For that reason. Absolutely. You know, oh, yeah. and so many amazing quality people who would really make you really happy, yeah. you neglect it because you have some um, idealized standard that really would never make you happy at the end of the day. Sure. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But all these other things matter a lot more, right? And you've had to work really hard. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Because if you thought they were attractive, everybody else thought they were attractive yeah. too. And so it's, it's actually uh, interesting. There's a slight negative correlation between, uh, so if a heterosexual woman has an attractive male partner, uh, her stability is actually a little bit lower. Yeah, I remember that part in the book. I yeah, love, I, I love that part. You know, and, and people are like, "Oh, so why is why is that the case?" And it's like, "Well, that, that dude's attractive to other people <laughs> too, right?" Yeah, 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 yeah. And we're in a culture where uh, cheating is one of those things that yeah. can be a one shot deal, and yeah. and and things are done. So, look, if you have a if someone out there has an attractive male partner, it doesn't mean he's cheating yeah, <laughs> necessarily. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, but yeah, you know, it's it's the looks and money. I, I understand why. why People are attracted to that. I could understand why I yeah, would yeah, be attracted yeah. to that. Um, and, and the backdrop to that, to return to our earlier conversation about kind of the evolution of mm -hmm. all of this, is that, you know, if you were uh, living in an environment where there wasn't enough food to go around, mm -hmm. well, it would be good to prioritize yeah, exactly. someone who could provide in that way mm -hmm. when not everybody could. And now we have a surplus of calories, exactly. right? We have yeah. the opposite problem. Uh, with looks, the thought was is uh, looks for an outside indicator of your genetic health. Mm -hmm. Now, it's not in this environment just because things are a lot safer now. Um, you know, medical care is better. Uh, we get the food we need and all, all yeah. that. But back when, right, when there was a lot more disease and it was, it was harder to get uh, the calories you needed just to survive, then having somebody with good, robust genetic health would have been would have been great. But now it doesn't really make sense. I think it's like wisdom teeth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? It's just this thing we have. It doesn't really do us any good and yeah. kind of causes a lot of pain. No, my friend, um, Stefan, speaks a great relationship expert who, you know, I'm on tour with and I'm learning a lot from. He, he made this point um, in regards to the twofold description that you described. The first one in regards to the money thing, mm. male or females, obviously females are leaning towards a money prioritizing thing. And he said, if you're a woman and you make two hundred thousand dollars a year and that is able to take care of your needs your husband's needs your children's needs your family's needs you'll never have issues with money mm -hmm. what is the problem with your husband being a teacher making thirty five thousand dollars a year sure absolutely there's not there's no difference like you said before in a society where women couldn't work yeah. Or where, where, you know, it was hunter-gatherer, and so men were usually, you needed a strong male to be able to gather the food. Obviously, for the for your children to live, you want the guy who can provide the most resources to support you. Right. But if you can support yourself and your family, and your man is hardworking but making less than you— sure. Why does that matter? Exactly. But yeah. for so many people, they can't. They they can't no, do yeah. that. Because, yeah. like you said, a lot of the things we don't understand is that there's societal influences that shape our views and push us away from ideal partners yeah. due to unrealistic standards that society has set for us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It just seems kind of counterintuitive for us to do that. It feels like you know, patting your tummy and rubbing your head yeah, <laughs> kind yeah, of thing. Yeah, like, yeah. ah, it's kind of difficult to coordinate all this. Yeah. But, but yeah, that, you know, we have these big prefrontal cortices right here, you know, where uh, we can inhibit yeah. our impulses, we yeah. can plan, uh, you know, and that's what we have to use. And we have to say, gosh, I, I know, like my wisdom tells me what's the right yeah, thing to do it's here, so hard. right? It's yeah, hard. yeah. It's so hard. But then you have to fight this kind of feeling in your gut. Yeah. Right? That, that's kind of telling you something different. Uh but That's I can the tell hard you, part. It, it is. Yeah, boy, it it sure is. And sometimes we have to learn the hard way, right? And that's and and that's a point that I realize so many people deal with because I once made a claim that a lot of people 
in a partner, they would choose the external characteristics over the internal. Mm-hmm. So if you could choose, I would argue for most people, if you could choose somebody, if you had two choices, somebody who had all the external, mm-hmm. but none of the internal, or somebody had all the internal, none of the external, most people in America who are pursuing passion and love would pick and have picked the external person without the internal. Sure. Yeah, yeah. And like you were saying, like, but we get burned by this, but then we keep going back yeah, to it. Yeah, 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 right. Yeah, but there's a lot of, you know, your gut's telling you one thing because this evolutionary pressure, right? Um, your society is telling you something. If you turn on your your TV or you open up your magazine, like, yeah, it's the external stuff. So many times, even when uh, the person is totally unappealing with the external stuff, has a great inside, then you you kiss the frog and they turn into something yeah. really handsome and, and chiseled, right? Yeah. Um, so, yeah, there's all of these narratives that are telling us that things should be one way. But I, I think that people are definitely smart enough to know what's best for them in the long run. Yeah. And one of my favorite studies that you brought up in the book was something that I really wanted the audience to be aware of. And we're, we're not going to give too much away of this about this book. I want you guys to buy it. But this is one of the last parts about the book that I want to give away for the audience was the part that you talked about um, how confirmation bias affects us when it comes to attraction. Mm-hmm. So um, you were talking about, and I, I'm a butcher. I always butcher this when I tell people this story, but you were talking about the study where they got a bunch of guys to call um, a call center, I think it was a call center, with women who were actually in the room next to them, and they gave the guys the pictures of the girls in the room. Remember that study? Yes, yes, Can you explain yeah. that study? I want to yeah, butcher sure. it. I want to butcher it. That was a great study. So, so this is back when. this I think the study was in the 1970s. Okay. So no cell phones or yeah, <laughs> anything yeah. like that. Yeah. So it was old school landlines. And um, the the ruse is this, is, is you're an undergraduate, you've come in the lab, and they say, you're going to have a phone conversation with a woman in a little bit here. But, hey, we have a, a folder here with some of the information about her just so you can have some things to talk about, right? Mm-hmm. Now, those folders were uh, randomly assigned to people. So you might get a folder where all the personality stuff and attitude stuff is held constant, okay? But the picture, she's pretty hot, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Now, other people, other guys, right, might get a folder where all the same personality and attitudes, uh, but now the picture is less attractive, Mm -hmm. right? So now they get on the phone (laughs) with with this uh, supposed woman who's somewhere else in the building. They have people listen. (laughs) I I just picture people silently picking up the other lines, right, to listen in. So they have research assistants listening in who can't see either person. Now... The person, the woman on the other end of the line could be anybody. Yeah. It's not the actual picture, yeah. right? <laughs> it's so, so it's funny. just a random assortment of women. <laughs> catfish they, before yeah. catfish. <laughs> they don't know. <laughs> this is, uh, yeah, analog catfishing, yeah. I guess. But, uh, you know, they don't know these guys. They think that they're, they look a certain way. So what happens is, is the people, listen, the research assistants listening into these conversations find that when the guy thinks... This is there's some hot woman on the other end. He's nicer. Mm-hmm. He asks more questions. He's more interested, <laughs> oh my right? Gosh. And so now what's happening? He's evoking a more interesting conversation. Yeah. And so she comes off as more attractive, right? Yeah. And, and, and interesting and engaged. And he's been much more interested in the conversation. And now things have gone really well. Mm. Now, when the picture was less attractive, they thought they were talking to someone who wasn't um, that good looking. Mm. Kind of. Typical guy, <laughs> sort of, you know, mild interest, yeah. uh, sort of uh, talking about themselves and, yeah. and that kind of thing. And then the woman at the under, other end of the line doesn't sound as interesting. Exactly. Because she's talking to someone who's less interested. Exactly. Right. So, yeah, there is this confirmation bias and uh, they call it the what is beautiful is good mm. stereotype. Yeah. And we imbue physically attractive people with all of these myths Mm. (laughs) right that they're smarter and nicer and all these other things and they've actually done studies where they've tried to see well maybe it's true maybe if you are physically attractive from birth right you get treated differently by everybody you do turn out nicer and more sociable and it's just not true 
Mm. You know, uh, it's not to say good looking people are worse <laughs> than anybody else. I'm a nice uh, person. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah you, you've done perfectly well in life. So. Uh, but, but, they're, but they're no better yeah. either, right? But we think, we think that they are. And I, I, what really stood out to me about that point was how you even brought up how it gets to a point where now you see things that weren't there. Yeah. So, for example, you might be a guy and it might be a beautiful woman. And then, you know, she says hello to you. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. She's so sweet and friendly and inviting. <laughs> but she says hello to everybody. Yeah, yeah. You know exactly. what I mean? And exactly. then another girl says hello to you. And they're like, oh, she's okay. Right. Like, you literally then begin to highlight the positives. And then you also begin to diminish the negatives. Exactly. Exactly. So you begin to create a false caricature of this individual simply based upon what's going on in your head. Yeah. You're filtering things, right, to a certain lens. Let's say she she ghosts you for a day, right yeah. on on the phone. Yeah. You're like, oh, she's so mysterious. <laughs> you know, right? and it's like, yeah, yeah. well, I don't know, maybe, <laughs> but probably not. Yeah. Right. So yeah, it's it's uh, it, once we get that set though in place, uh, this person's attractive, and then they must have all these great characteristics, and we almost try to wish it to be true. Right, uh, gets us in a whole heck of a lot of trouble. But sometimes you gotta you gotta mess it up a few yeah, times, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Before you're like, oh man, it uh, that, that can really that can really get me. So mm-hmm. and once again, you know, it's not to vilify. Yeah, people who are physically attractive. It's just like, hey, they're just like everybody else. Exactly, and that's the point. Is like we're not demonizing anybody or saying anybody's less than because of what you have or what you don't have. Right. It's saying that in reality, which I love you bring up in the book, it goes back to. In regards to romantic relationship, the most important component is how the other person treats me. Sure. And that's something that is probably the least thing on the, the grand list of things. Yeah. You know, where in reality is that if somebody treats you really well and there is a general threshold where they meet for physical attractiveness and religious beliefs and political beliefs and whatever ideological beliefs you have, mm-hmm. the, the, the likelihood of that success is so astronomically higher than simply going for the vanity things that we go for in today's world. That's, that's exactly true. Mm-hmm. So, you know, if you look at these um, behavioral studies where they look at what people actually choose, mm-hmm. uh, so you get the looks and the uh, money uh, up there in the top, top two. Um, but then to go to this earlier point about so what gets kicked out of there, well, one of the things that gets kicked out, if we want to think about personality, for example, is emotional stability. Mm. So uh, the opposite of that is neuroticism, yep. <laughs> or being real moody and kind of angry. And uh, no surprise, right? Our common sense mm-hmm. tells us this, that if someone's pretty neurotic, that makes for tough, tough going yep. <laughs> in a long-term relationship. Mm-hmm. Um you know, they tend to be pretty reactive, pretty uneven, and you're, you're getting, if you're neurotic, you're not enjoying things as much. Uh, if you're with someone who's neurotic, you're not enjoying things yeah, <laughs> as yeah, much, yeah, right? Yeah. Um, and so it's strongly associated with less satisfaction and also a higher risk of breaking up or, or divorce. And while that sounds like common sense, that trait drops to between sixth and ninth on mm. the list of priorities. So people might say, well, that, that makes sense, but it's like, but you're not doing it, mm-hmm. <laughs> right? Yeah. And if we play that game where we project ahead, let's say 20, 30 years, and we say, okay, so you're with somebody now a long time, and you're sitting there having dinner, and something's gone wrong, do you want someone who's going to overreact to that situation? Yeah. Uh, or do you want someone who's going to be pretty cool mm-hmm. about it? Uh, let's say you got kids sitting at the table with you. Do you want someone who's going to handle that in an even kind of manner uh, or someone who's going to be, you know, all over the place or, or getting into business. Yeah. And, and the answer is really easy uh, mm, to yeah. that. And so, you know, I think it's interesting that we can overvalue looks or overvalue money. And then sometimes what happens is we just accidentally end up marrying <laughs> that yeah, person, yeah, right? Yeah, like we yeah. got on the track with them. Yeah. All of a sudden it's like four or five years later. Yeah. And what you see people do is they're just like, well, I might as well just lock this down, mm-hmm. you know? Um, but now they're missing some of these qualities that would really be integral you yeah. know, to making the long-term thing work. Exactly. Going back to that marathon thing, if this person really can't run a marathon, if they're yeah. not built for it, oh, sure. it's only a matter of time before they can't run the race any yeah. longer. Yeah. And the point that I think that you would continue to talk about in the book is the problem is so many people are so focused on what's in front of them mm-hmm. and like whatever they're 
going back to infatuation, right? It, like the idea of this, you know, I, you know, this perfect partner based upon nothing about who they are, but all about how you temper, how you feel. Yeah. And that's the biggest thing going back to the point I want to bring up mm-hmm. about this, about your book was so good was that the, if the romantic feelings are the litmus test for you or, or the passionate feelings are the limit test for you to be able to choose a partner is the worst possible thing because that feeling will in due time go away yeah. and you'll find somebody because there are people who I just think biologically they can they they cultivate that in all people right mm-hmm. they're super beautiful models who will give anybody passionate yeah. <laughs> romance <laughs> right. and it's really tall successful guys will make any woman mm-hmm. have those feelings but those feelings don't mean that person is good for you yeah. and that's some of the biggest challenges and one of the reasons why I love your book is because your book gives the audience and the readers a healthy reasonable blueprint to find out how to be able to find somebody who's best for you. Yeah, I, I appreciate that. You know, I, I think um, the, the frameworks are there, right? And I, I think there's a lot of just common sense people can use. It's It doesn't have to be this wild mathematical, you know, esoteric research kind of thing, although that can be helpful in its own way. Um, but yeah, when you back translate it, and you're like, so, okay, so what, so what really matters to you? You know, if you're a young person, think about an older couple you know. You know, maybe it's your grandparents, maybe it's, you know, some, someone in your community uh, who've been together for a long time, and you think about the qualities they have in their relationship, but also as individuals. You know, almost all the time, people come back and say, well, they were pretty emotionally stable, right? Um, they're very kind. Like, they're just nice people. Like, like being a nice guy or a nice gal in our culture gets bad wrath <laughs> sometimes. Uh, I'm always fascinated that when someone makes their initial public offering of their partner to the group of friends, right, uh, that, that partner will, the, the new partner goes away to the restroom at some point or something. And then your friend says, so what do you think? If you say, you know, I think she's nice. They, they almost seem insulted. You know, right? <laughs> yeah, they, yeah, yeah. Oh, is that it? You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but in fact, that's one of the best traits that you can get yeah. in a partner. Uh, gosh, wouldn't it be great to have someone be nice to you for 50 years? Yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah, that's um, true. Be nice to your kids for, for, for 50 years. Uh, there's all these other things that go along with it, for example. So people who are high in agreeableness, kind of this kindness, niceness uh, quality, they also view relationships in a non-zero-sum kind of way. So in other words, it's not, hey, I'll do something nice for you, now you do something nice for me, right? Always keep them score. They just give. And they're going to trust that, hey, over time, uh, things are going to be equitable, things are going to work out. And when both partners have that mentality, now you exponentially grow the amount of goodness in the relationship. So, you know, these, these personality traits and these other psychological qualities that are so important, um, I, I think people can connect with those uh, pretty readily and, and pretty easily, but then they have to balance that out with this cost-benefit analysis of these things that do draw us in initially and that are really powerful. No, that's 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 really good, and that's probably where um, your book took me on a journey because I realized that most of my life, all the women that I really was interested in pursuing. It had nothing to do with how they treated me. <laughs> like it never, it never dawned on me. Like they, like they treated me nicely or kindly. It was yeah. never the draw. The draw was always how she looked or something like that. Like it was always physical. Sure, yeah. And it was like I realized that it wasn't until I met a girl who wasn't everything I wanted physically, which mm. is a typical story for mm-hmm. everybody. <laughs> yeah. it wasn't everything I wanted physically, but emotionally, like you said in the book, was a person who would literally, like, give and serve and be kind and supportive and values, all similar, that this girl became, like, my favorite girl, (laughs) you know, of all time. So I I really, really, man, I'm so thankful for your book. Um, Guys, if you have not got in the book the link is in the description the science of happily ever after is an exceptional book it has really transformed my life i know that's going to transform your life so ty if there's one message you want to give our audience to in closing what would that message be well uh i guess we've talked about a few heavy things <laughs> you know here but after all the research and after all the people i've spoken to over the years i you know 
I'm a believer. Like I'm a hopeful person in the state of romantic love. And when you see it work, boy, there's just nothing better in life, I, I, I think. I agree right? with you 100%. Than seeing something like that happen and, and the goodness that, that manif- manifests from that outside of even the relationship itself. Um, I think it's a beautiful thing. So uh, if people are out there and it's been a tough go, uh, keep the chin up mm-hmm. and, uh, and and be hopeful and, and be optimistic. But that the person's out there and you know who that person is, mm-hmm. I think. And if people just have that focus uh, and that honesty with themselves, then it gives them a much better chance. That's so awesome, Ty. Thank you so much. We were really, really blessed, guys. Make sure you reach out to Ty. Where can they reach out to you at? Well, uh, they go to tytoshiro.com if they want, and they can find everything there, uh, including links to Instagram and Twitter and all that good stuff. But uh, yeah, I'd love to hear uh, how people resonate with this and uh, what kinds of things they can use. That's awesome. So guys, like I said, for the hundredth time, <laughs> be sure to get Ty's book, The Signs of Happy Ever After. The link is in the description below. Ty, thank you so much. It's an honor. My name is Afis and I'm joined by Ty Shiro. Thanks so much for having me. And we are the roommates and adios.